So just so, just so everyone's aware, this is a more fun talk. It's an opinion piece. Um, hopefully, you might learn stuff about how you might negotiate your way if you work at a startup. Um, there's some serious topics about Kubernetes and Blazor and things if you need to go to them, but it's the end of the day, and it's much easier to have something like this to watch, I think. Um, normally, I'd do a slide where I'd tell you who I am and where I've worked, but that's the entire presentation is who I am and where I've worked, so it seems pointless to kind of do that at the start. Um, so we're just going to describe, I don't know who's read the agenda, um, the detailed abstract, but it's four different startups I've worked on over the, worked in in the past 18 years, and how they were formed, the kind of benefits that were there, how it worked, uh, how it ended, or how I left, things I learned, all that kind of thing. So. And given that it was 18 years, I thought, how on earth can I give you a feel about the time that this startup existed in? Um, how would you understand the kind of technology landscape 18 years ago when I was at Smashed Atom, an interactive TV company? And I decided uh, that I would do it by showing you the phone I used. <laughs> right? This was my phone when I was at Smashed Atom. Uh, this is the very phone. I got it out from under a desk, uh, out of a box, turned it on after charging it a bit, and it still turns on, and you can still make a call from it. Uh, anyone know what that is? Yeah. 8310. It was the smallest phone you ever got to before everyone went to big phones again. Um, if anyone's a fan of Futurama, there was one point where they had the smallest phone in the world that just sat on her fingertip. And it was so easy to lose, she had a massive charger to put it on. That's where we were going until someone decided you needed touch screens, and suddenly now everyone's got screens that can only put in a bag. Um, yeah, it had GPRS, the first phone with data, and the way you used that data was to infrared link it to your laptop. Right? No kidding. Um, and then to go with that high-tech GPRS, it also had an FM radio in it. Um, but that's the kind of phone I had at the time. Uh, I was quite happy with it. Um, so, Smashed Atom, I was previous to Smashed Atom, I was working at B Sky B. So, Sky News is one of their channels, so you may have heard of it. I know there's a Sky News Australia, kind of partly affiliated. Um, and I was there pretty soon after it launched. But in my head, it had always been there, but it was about two years afterwards. And it acted almost like a startup TV company because it was run by Aussies uh, in those days. Uh, they're pretty direct. Uh, they're on the bus with you coming from the tube station, even though they're the head of Sky News. Um, they're the kind of person that when you go to the gents, they have a chat with you at the urinal, make you feel very uncomfortable uh, because you don't want to discuss business. But it was a fun place to work. And I did graphics for elections, for weather, for sports, things like that. And we also started doing something called interactive television. And uh, that's how I got headhunted into this company called Smashed Atom. Now, for those who, who are really young, interactive television doesn't really exist anymore uh, because you don't need it. Um, but interactive television was a big thing. So even if it was a satellite dish, it had a modem in it, a uh, dial-up modem. If it was a cable set-top box, it could get to the network via the cable. And it meant that for people who didn't have broadband or didn't, and you didn't have phones with data, you could use an application on your TV via the television box. Uh, it was like programming washing machines. You had no memory, very little power, um, because you have to remember that these things were put in millions of homes. So if it cost an extra $100 to put that box in, that was 100 times a million homes. That's 100 million. No one did that because you never charged for these boxes. Um, so they were really low power. So there was this cable television company in the UK called Telewest. It had a arm called FlexTech, was its TV arm, and they had an interactive division, and they spun it out, and 60% of it was owned by this cable company, and 40% was proper VC, uh, this company called Atomic Tangerine, which was part of the Stanford Research Institute. So quite a proper startup. The credentials, well, it had VC funding from the US. We are in the final wave of the first dot-com boom, it has to be said. Uh, we were trained on things like how to write patents, because that was where everyone thought the money was. Um, and 
when they started, because they'd moved this whole division out of a TV company, they gave everyone mugs with their own name on, individual names on every mug, which is a very startup thing to do. Uh, because I started later, I got a new boy mug. Um, but it's, it's giving the game away that eventually it folded. I, ab I was able to buy these at 50p a shot in the fire sale at the end. Um, and another startup credential was the fact that I got employed by, from B Sky B by this headhunter. And I was employed, and when I got there, I said, what am I doing? And they goes, we're not sure yet, but we need someone like you. <laughs> so th they genuinely were just hiring people because you should hire people like that. Um, the headhunter apparently claimed that I was a long haul person. So they categorized people as domestic, short haul, and long haul was for how long you could sit next to them on a plane. And so I was long haul, which apparently meant I was interesting to talk to. Uh, you may differ by the end of this talk, in your opinion. Uh, why wasn't it a startup? Well, it's a bit weird. Given it was a new company, uh, and we only had 60 people, if that, in one open plan office, we had a knowledge officer who was paid about 100,000 pounds in 2001 to make sure we collaborated properly, when we could just walk between each other's desks and talk to each other. Um, even small projects. So, say you were going to do a demo for a client, and you just went, right, a designer can help me for half a day, we can program the demo, it's just a spike of how we could do this, it takes two, three days. Project manager would get out Microsoft Project, press a button saying, create me the template, and you had a three-week project that cost four times as much and was unviable as a test project. So, it's really weird. Um, and it's because the CTO and COO, or CEO and COO, Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officers, <laughs> were ex logica and they had the logica kind of mindset of big projects, and they had to when they were doing cable TV system, but you don't do it when you're writing little apps even to go and set up boxes. Um, and they even had this thing where they worked out, well, not everyone's being used, so we had to fill out timesheets, so you're trying to build yourself, because it's consultancy. And they said, well, if you're not on a project, what are you doing? Well, maybe you could kind of help on a project that you haven't been, you can't bill for. So project managers started not including you in project plans so that you wouldn't be working so they could put you on the project for no money, <laughs> right? This was just insane in a startup. So, so those were the things that didn't make it a startup in my head. Um, we did have a few benefits because it came from a previous big company it had pension and life assurance. We nearly got share options, but not quite. And this pay space intentionally left blank because startups don't have a lot of benefits normally. Um, you have to realize that you don't get benefits at startups uh, in the same way. Um, the pension was unusual at that time because now it's a legal requirement in the UK that you have to have a pension scheme in a company with more than five employees. But in those days, they could have not had a pension scheme at all. And when I was starting this, because so, I proposed this talk, and I thought, what are the slides going to be? Benefit for me. <laughs> yeah. And then I realized that every company has crazy shit <laughs> as well. And, and there's more crazy shit in startups. That's the interesting bit. Um, so we had a new office. We had orange pillar, concrete pillars. They painted them orange to be on message with the logos down here. And I've colored the slides in the colors of all these companies. Um, the head of design, after a week of watching the paint dry, said, it's slightly the wrong Pantone color. <laughs> 4,000 quid to repaint, and another week of being in an office at Stanford Paint. Fortunately, she didn't take the goldfish out of the tank and paint the hell out of them either. Um, I also, very early on in the company, saw a demo of an application that we were showing to clients of the kind of application we could write. And it was done in something called Macromedia Director. This was like halfway between video editing and animation and produced flash files to demo kind of how you might do things. They were doing things that were completely impossible to do on set-top boxes. There was no way you could do them. And I was absolutely horrified when I was talking to a guy, please don't show that to a client because we can't do that. Um, and I know you can't do it because I'd worked at Sky programming set-top boxes and we knew the limitations which were quite severe on how they worked. And then towards the end of my time at smashed at them. Um, BT, which is British Telecom, uh, the old British Telecom, like Telstra, had this whole project where they were going to put video over IP into everyone's homes, 
use a kind of free view, uh, free view aerial signal to do the free stations, but then have video on demand. Uh, and actually broadcast video as well, which was multicast all the way to the telcos with their own backbone network. Uh, this is a request for a proposal which on double-sided A4 was a meter high on the table, and we were one little chunk of this. Uh, remembering, by the way, that an RFP doesn't get you paid normally. So we were in with a big consultancy in Fujitsu, Siemens, and things like that. Uh, there were weird things. Oh, that was the interesting thing. It was called Project Simon because it was to keep it simple, one meter high. Um, and they wanted things like the set-top box has to be capable of being putting a cardboard box and fitting through a letterbox so that you could self-service install the set-top box. Um, the fact that Fujitsu Siemens had something bigger than the original Xbox that was a really a PC chassis that pretended to be a set-top box, and that was the initial box, didn't occur to them. So it was quite funny working on stuff like that. And we were inventing, genuinely going to create how we were going to deliver EPG data as a private MPEG. So we're just creating standards out of, out of the air, uh, because it's the kind of thing you do when you're in these proposals. Um, but all weird things have to come to an end. Um, and it came to an end within six months, or seven months of me being there, uh, because 2001 was a dot-com bust. Uh, one night we went to the pub, and the financial controller uh, had two bags with her. And we said, oh, you're going away for the weekend. And she went, <coughs> no, I'm just bringing some stuff home from the office. That was everything she had in the office, because she didn't think we were going to get in on the Monday morning. So she took all her stuff home. So if you know an accountant at your company who suddenly clears everything off her desk, clear everything off your desk, <laughs> just in case, it'd be a good move. Uh, she's now my account, company accountant for my little limited company that I run. So she, I've kept in touch with her. She's a good laugh. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, she tells me off for not submitting my tax returns on time uh, for the company. Um, and we were coming to this dot-com bust, and we knew there was a bit going to be a bit of a problem. The stock market had started falling on dot-com boom companies. We had something that I found later is a HR standard in these kind of things. Uh, there was a famous online store in the UK called boo.com um, that went bust horribly. It did this room A, room B thing, and they get half of the company go to room A, your name's on the door, half of them go to room B. We went into room A. Everyone in room A was told, you need to leave the building. And we all go, shit. And, I goes, and we think, that's it, we're out of a job. No, we have to leave the building for three hours while they sack everyone else who was in room B. <laughs> right? So that when we come back, no one is in the office when we come back. And that all their stuff is gone. So it was really bizarre. So oddly enough, with no work to do, and the fact that we we're just trying to get bought by another company, and we were just kept on as a skeleton crew. Uh, we didn't have much work, so we went to the pub every lunchtime. Uh, the Bricklayer's Arms around the corner, a really nice pub in the center of town. And on September the 11th, all the phones went off that when we were sat down. And we f then had to run back to watch the television and went, that'll be the end of the company then. And it was. It was about two weeks later. It was like, that's it. There's no way anyone's going to buy anything now because the whole market was dead because the whole stock market crashed, everyone went into lockdown. Um, and now about the only thing I could actually find about Smashed Atom, 18 years on in the internet, is an article from The Guardian, the UK newspaper. Um, I recognize exactly what it says, because there may be some reason The Guardian had that story. <laughs> um, so it's the only time I've ever leaked a story. <laughs> so it was quite funny. Um, we got into trouble about that, because we shouldn't really have done that. Um, so well, what was the legacy? So this was th my introduction to the world of startups, you know, a pretty brutal one in that sense. Um, the legacy, I think, was because it ended suddenly, everyone kept in touch. Like, genuinely, everyone kept in touch. If it fizzled out, it wouldn't have happened in the same way. So the senior network engineer, Phil, recommended for me for my next startup working back at B Sky B, a project for them. The head of development, Doug, brought me back in to work at Cello Media, a, a Dutch cable TV company. And more importantly, I kind of broke away from this being at this big company, or it was going to become a big company, B Sky B, uh, 
worked out that I liked startups, even though they're a bit weird. Uh, and I liked cycling to work in the centre of London. It takes me about an hour to get to work, and I still do it. I still cycle in four days a week, um, which means I don't need to go to a gym. Uh, but I do kind of have interesting scrapes with traffic every now and then. Uh, and I started attending meetups and user groups because I was now in the centre of town. If I'd have stayed at B Sky B, which is way on the outskirts of London, so it's a good, you know, hour on the tube to get from the centre of London or 40 minutes to B Sky B. I'd never have um, hung around with loads of other developers, the alt.net scene, all sorts of things I would have missed out on. So what was I going to do at the end of this? Um, the nice thing was that because it was a big TV company who owned a chunk of it, they did pay us off and give us redundancy so we didn't get completely uh, jettisoned because the reputational damage to them would have been so huge that they decided to cough up my money. Um, so I was going, what are we going to do? And I was chatting to someone I'd worked with at the breakfast TV company in the UK, the commercial TV company called GMTV. And they'd put in networking um, and IT systems. They had a company called Deus Ex Machina, but they didn't do software. So I said, how about we form a company uh, to do software for TV companies? And we called it the original thinking group, uh, where I still had a Nokia 8310. Uh, because in those days, you had a phone for years, and they didn't kind of change, really. Um, so yes, so what we wanted to do was develop systems for companies that he already had contacts with. Um, so he had um, worked for Tiger Aspect. Um, if you don't know who Tiger Aspect was, well, I think I'll mention it on the next page, but production company, they make Peaky Blinders. That's one of the things they make now. Uh, Hat Trick Productions, who do Have I Got News For You, which you may see in the Kumars and Room 101 and a whole load of stuff. Um, and so I had a chat, and we went, right, you've got offices in the middle of London. You've got premises. You can provide office space and accounting services and all the business kind of stuff. I can merge all my assets in from my company. We can form this new company, and I can, I've got contacts in Interactive TV and other companies. You've got co uh, contacts in these production companies. And the cash flow was privately funded by the main shareholder of DEM. Because that's one of the hardest things you can do when you start a company is where do you get the cash from to run for the first six months. Um, later on, when I actually ran my own company completely, it's called the Wilderness Years, I ran on credit card debt of about £10,000 for the first year on 0% credit cards and then gradually paid it back off when all the invoices got paid. But you need that kind of thing. So this was quite nice for me. Uh, it halved my salary I went from 60000 a year to 30000 uh, because you don't pay yourself properly in startups if you own them. So yes, so I had a profit incentive to get myself to 25% shareholding. Uh, so he was quite tenacious in his negotiation skills with me. 25% um, is important, by the way, if you own a company in the UK because anything less than that and the other person becomes a majority shareholder and can ignore everything that you say. So you can't, you, once you've got 25%, you can block things. So it's a really important bit. Um, so we got off the accountancy services office costs all were cross-charged. Uh, we took on a junior programmer from DEM, but he was rubbish um, because he wasn't very good at programming. He did VB script and stuff in Excel and things, uh, and he hadn't got the attitude to be a programmer. It was really wasn't in him uh, to do it. Uh, the interesting thing is to get the word group into a company name in the UK, you need to have three companies with common shareholdings. So we had DEM, we had Original Thinking Group itself, and then we registered a brand new company in the UK which still exists called PLBCK, which is Problem Lies Between Chair and Keyboard. <laughs> right, that's what that stands for. Uh, you go to company's house on the web, you can find that company still exists, and it's still there. And that was just so we could put the name group. It took us four days to get to Original Thinking Group and shortening it to original TG when we wanted to kind of refer to it, you know, easily. Um, obviously, I've already said that my salary halved. Um, it's a skinny company because you kind of <laughs> have started it from scratch and you're bootstrapping it with your own money, so there is really no benefits. 
because um, you work quite hard when it's your own company as well. You don't tend to have a lot of time free. So our client base, as I said, was these TV companies that they already had deals with. And then the really important one was, as I said, the ex-network engineer at Smashed Atom knew a, through f as a product manager who'd been at Flextech, worked at this new company called Umedia. Uh, they wanted a SMS to screen service with moderation of the messages uh, because you can't just allow a viewer to send any message in and put it on there. You have to take out the swear words, the racism, all sorts of things. There's a whole load of things and curate it. Uh, so we did that. Um, and he brought us in. He was doing all the network infrastructure. We were going to do all the software for it and the broadcast side. Um, bizarrely, in, this day, in these days, B-Sky-B chose to use their own framework that they built uh, to do their app. And it was written in WML, which was WAP HTML, which was the thing that phones had. And they'd made a WAP engine to run on a set-top box to make it easy to program, which is not the easiest thing to program. Um, so we were going to get a share of income from the SMS messages. Um, it was quite interesting because this is my first experience, by the way, of a product manager or business analyst in a startup, which was Umedia being the startup here, going, this is going to be so successful. We're going to have so many messages. You're going to get a one tenth of a p penny from every message. You're going to be so rich. It's gonna, you're going to get half a million in the next three years or whatever. Uh, to which my experienced business partner said, I think you're talking crap. We will put a minimum income guarantee into the contract. And we went right to the wire and managed to get a minimum um, income of about 200,000 uh, a year. Um, to do that, we also had to say that we own the source code unless we go bankrupt, right? Because this is so, I had to learn about escrow and putting things with a lawyer so that people could get hold of the code. You know, it's quite a reasonable thing to ask. Um, the tricky bit was, the reality is, Sky decided you couldn't send it by SMS, you could only do it on the remote control through the box, which made it virtually impossible for anyone to use. It takes quite a lot of money to pay people to moderate messages, because it's not automated. This isn't AI, this isn't deep knowledge. This is students or mums with kids at home checking messages and pushing them through the system. The shortfall was astounding on how many messages they got. They did not get the millions of messages that were in the spreadsheet that they showed us. They got hardly any. They attempted to not pay our invoices, so we had to pay the VAT or sales tax on them to try and force us to go bankrupt so that they could get the source code. That's pretty much what they did to us. Fortunately, I had a business partner who went, I've got money in the bank, fuck them, I'm going to pay the VAT and then we'll take them to court. And we got the whole of the money. And the reason we managed to do this, which we only found about a year later, is that in all those negotiations where we forced them into this minimum, um, minimum income is because myself and the network engineer were named people in the contract with B-Sky-B so that B-Sky-B would not have gone with the project had we not been on the contract, which we didn't know at the time. So it was quite interesting that that's why they had to accept this because it's such a big thing for them to get a big client like B-Sky-B that they uh, took the risk. Um, so that was lessons quite hard learned of how companies operate and try and make you go bust. Um, but we ran it for about two and a half years. To be honest, the recession that was post 9-11 carried on way longer. The TV industry was really hit. Uh, in, well, rather, advertising was hit, which meant TV industry was hit because that's where the money comes from. So it's hard to find regular income. So we actually closed down the company with money in the bank. And I took about 20,000 out of it, and the business partner took about the other lot, so about 60. Um, he never paid himself, so that really was his salary for two years, of, you know, because I was the only one who got paid apart from our single employee. But the interesting bit was I went into a meeting room with him to go, I'm sorry, mate, we're going to have to close the company down. And I was feeling horribly guilty and going, shit, I'm going to, you know, this is someone's rent that I'm covering, you know, mortgage and things like that. And he said, I've got to tell you something first. I'm going to leave the company. <laughs> and we came out 
absolutely hysterical and smiling to my business partner going, what the hell happened? And I went, he was going to leave. He knew what was happening and we hadn't got enough money. So he'd already decided to go on two months around New Zealand and the US on a bicycle. So it all ended up really nice. And about a few weeks later, my first child was born. Um, so it's quite good. So my legacy learning from being at that company was how hard it is to employ people in your own company where you're responsible for paying their bills. So because if you own a company, you get paid last or not at all. That, that's the reality of it. Um, you've got to get the money in. You've got to get the, the clients in. Uh, and I learned a load about contract negotiation. I learned how to read a profit and loss sheet, and I still hate them. I just find them really tedious. Um, so, um, but you have to learn that kind of thing. It helps you later on when you're trying to talk to people because you suddenly do understand about capital depreciation, uh, capital expenses versus operating expenses, and you'll have these discussions with people, and they go, can't we just buy this? And you go, well, that gets written off over four years, and uh, that has to go on an asset sheet, and that becomes a thing that VC companies hate, is owning to it. Uh, with they would rather burn your time fruitlessly and make you work harder because it's an operating expense that's immediately deductible from tax. So it's all really nasty, but you get to learn about all that kind of stuff. So that was my um, second startup, uh, a tiny little one, self-started. And then I went into what we'll call the wilderness years, which is when I was a contractor or a consultant. Uh, the wilderness years involved ridiculous numbers of Windows phones. Right? Uh, the best one being actually, this, this was, I think it was called the HTC Typhoon. It was in the UK, it was the Orange SPV C500. Um, um, and then, remember when they used to have phones that looked like PDAs, but they opened and they had a keyboard on them? Uh, and this one even, it went at an angle, so it looked like you had a mini laptop. Um, I actually got that powered up, and my 12-year-old was fascinated by it and started using it and started taking photos with it and all sorts of weird stuff. And she was like, not, the 15-year-old was, what the hell's that? And then the young ones were like, this is cool. <laughs> wow, it's got a keyboard. I was like, weird. Um, I, just, I didn't get that one to turn on because that one had a dab radio in, uh, which was a weird thing. That's why it, it looks like it's been hit with an ugly stick uh, because it has been hit with an ugly stick. That actually had TV channels broadcast to it over a dab radio signal so you could watch live TV on it without using data. It was weird. <laughs> um, but yes, and, and the whole that was a wilderness year's time. Um, so I worked at QVC UK. I produced a similar moderation service that we'd sold to Sky. Um, that taught me about a sales pipeline. It took two years to get them to buy it. And then for seven years, they had it in pilot and paid me 600 pounds a month for keeping it in pilot, which bankrolled the whole company's uh, rent, office rent and overheads. Um, I also went to work for Cello Media via the Hex Head of Development. We launched a live shopping channel. Um, there's some fun talks before the party, and there's something about successes. Uh, and I'm giving one about how we launched a shopping channel in six months, which I did in these wilderness years. Uh, and I also worked on hospital systems via contacts I made at the user group. Uh, the legacy of all this is I had no pension, but I did pay my own life insurance because I had a kid. So I started. You know, when you have a kid, you kind of get life insurance for 16 years, and then you hope they'll be gone by that point. So um, this is the point where you buy a house, get life insurance for the kids, and are all set up and have the biggest mortgage, and turn to your other half and go, I am the most valuable I have ever been. You need to push me off a cliff now, and you'll get the house and all my life insurance. Um, yes, it's a loving moment when you realize that every moment you're with me from now on, I'm worth less money. Um, <laughs> So I was free to set my own hours, which is really cool because I used to pick them up from nursery every other week in the, in the evening and drop them off in the mornings and things like that. I had more time to talk at user groups and developer conferences. London.net user group, if anyone knows Ian Cooper, that's where I met him. There was a load of guys who did alt.net type new stuff. He encouraged me to talk. I ended up doing local conferences, I ended up at NDC, and now I'm in Sydney because I left B Sky B and started working in central London at the first startup, effectively. And I became a Microsoft MVP. It was really cool. So, but eventually, my other half said, you've been flouncing around looking after kids, only working three days a week. Uh, I was at offices in Kew Gardens, 
So everyone who was in this open plan office were self-employed, they all owned their own companies. So if it was nice weather in summer, we all just looked at each other at about 12 and went, fuck it, down the pub. <laughs> all right, so, um, which is just horrific because we did it quite regularly. Um, and eventually my other half went, you could earn more money, couldn't you? And I want to stop, I want to stop working in TV and I want to be with the kids more. So I had to switch over, so I had to get a real job, uh, which was another startup, startup number three, which is IMC Group. So this was an MP3 startup. So this was in the era where iTunes had just about, uh, just started not copy protecting their music. Seven Digital had started selling stuff, which was a big company in the UK at the time, selling MP3 downloads. Um, one of the characteristics of startups is they rename themselves as well. So it, halfway through my time there, it became Criteria MX. Um, while I was there, I still had a candy bar mobile, Windows Mobile, but I started buying Android devices as well. So that was the first ZTE Blade, the first hundred, well, sub 100 pound Android phone. It ran, I think, gingerbread or KitKat. It was really, yeah, clunky. Um, but they were good fun. So yes, so I decided I'll go to this startup. Um, I'd found out about it at an alt.net meetup. Uh, someone I knew worked there. And then she said, here's the recruiter for us. And the recruiter was drunk. Uh, and you know she was drunk because this was a recruiter when I said I was thinking of applying. Said, well, if you already know him, you don't need to go through me, just apply directly. Cool. Mentioned that to her about three months later. And she went, what the f did I do that for? <laughs> I've missed out on a huge amount of commission, which is quite correct. Uh, she couldn't believe she'd told me that. So it was quite funny. Um, so the formation of this company was um, privately funded by high net worth individuals, which is a terrible phrase, but angel investors, realistically. Um, it really was started by a guy called Alan Callan, uh, and he started, helped start the record label for Led Zeppelin. So he worked with Warner Music, he was in the music industry, um, he just swan in from Monaco, knowing uh, people in the industry, artists, going, hey, there's this new, new band, blah, 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 and he's really cool. Um, it was horrible structure. There was Monaco, Luxembourg, Isle of Man, Jersey, Guernsey, God knows where else there was. There was bits in Dubai as well, I think. Um, he was an interesting character, is the phrase I would say. Um, when I met him, he'd uh, been diagnosed with bone cancer and had two years to live and had already lived five years and lived about another four, so he exceeded his expectation. Um, but he was mad as a bag of frog. Uh, at times, so you just had to deal with that. Um, startup credentials, well, obviously we immediately moved offices within one week of me starting. Uh, I remember being interviewed by the CTO, he had a broken leg propped up on a desk while he interviewed me. The head of development had seen me talk at a conference and said, hey, your talk was really good, it was fantastic, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going, I have to not lose this job. <laughs> I've got this job, haven't I? kind of thing. And it was the first proper agile crew I think I'd worked with. Um, two week sprints, retros, proper boards, agile zen, which was quite cool. We had build servers, test driven design by default. Um, it's amazing when you go in and there's already a team doing all that. It was fantastic. Um, mostly contractors. Um, we obviously had that company rename, which had a, bi a really nice side effect is we suddenly had a holding company that was less than two years old, which allowed us to apply for BizSpark and get loads of cheap software licenses, which was fantastic. Um, so there are advantages to having craziness like that. Um, uh, oddly enough, the company structure, the company we worked for owned nothing, not even the software we produced. It was owned by a different company compared to the company that owned the contracts with the music companies compared to the company that owned the, the, uh, the list was quite horrific. But we had full catalogs from Warner, EMI and Sony we never got United, uh, Universal, I mean, Universal Music Group, we never got before I left. We had 100 terabytes of storage in a rack in the office in the building, right? With, with all the un, unprotected original un, uncompressed files for all those back catalogs sat on 100 terabytes of storage. And then 25 terabytes in the, of MP3s in the data center. When you get all the content that EMI have, and that's the smallest out of these three. It turns up on one terabyte USB drives. 
on a pallet delivered by a forklift truck because it's heavy. And it takes about two days to download a terabyte over USB into your server and then weeks to transcode it all. So all this takes forever. Sony delivered it by FTP. It took two and a half months for Sony to deliver all their catalog over FTP, continuously pumping it into our building. Uh, we should have just got the hard drives in the end is what we worked out. But we were white labeling Daily Telegraph and Royal Opera House. Um, and you could clearly see we had very few sales, but actually our worth was the fact that we had the deals with the record companies. That was the valuable asset we owned. Um, benefits, well, not many. No pension. Share options rumored, but they never delivered. Um, I had to, one of our, our tech ops guys, and network engineers, um, was having a kid. And I said, what's the deal with paternity leave? Because it's the first person who'd ever had a kid in the company. And they said, well, just give him statutory paternity pay of £100 a week or something. And I said, do you not want him to pay his mortgage? You know, for rent. So I had to get him to be paid. The CFO actually said, and I think this was, when was this? 2012, something like that. I said, some dads don't want to be with their mum when they've had a kid. They come back to work straight away. And it's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> and I'll tell you now, you bloody came back to work because you're, you're much older. Um, so I managed to get him to be paid for at least one week. Um, and the interesting bit is I started as a contractor and I became full-time. And when I became full-time, there were two things I noticed. One, when I was a contractor, my contract had me working 40 hours a week. Uh, and it was obviously a boilerplate contract from some legal site. And then I got my full-time contract and it had me working 37 and a half hours a week because they had a different boilerplate contract. So by going full-time, you actually work less officially in your contract. Uh, but I also negotiated half-day Wednesday to collect the kids from school and just moved the hours to different days of the week. So I didn't even lose any time. And I also went, you know what? I want to go to the MVP summit and I want to go to conferences. So can I have in my contract 10 days of, of, le of leave for conferences that's paid? and negotiated all that in. At the same time I was going full-time, the designer was going full-time. And then about six months later, he said, you keep going to these conferences. I goes, yeah, I've got paid leave. And he said, oh, I should ask for that. He tried to ask for it later and got told no. <laughs> you negotiate this when you start. You do not negotiate it later because it will not happen. So it was a good, and that contract negotiation was something that original TG taught me, that hard nose really have a, a haggle thing. Uh, so there must be some crazy shit that happens, especially with someone like Alan Callan, and there was. Uh, one of the things we did, the tsunami in Japan was hilarious. This, this went into the folder called crazy shit that Alan's asked for in my email box. Uh, he said, um, can we create a Japanese website to launch in a week's time selling music? We had no one Japanese in the company, no translators. We didn't have permission to sell the music and we didn't have a payment provider. There's all sorts of reasons why you're not going to get that done in a week uh, that we had to talk to him about. But we also, I wandered around Luxembourg data centers and, um, and that was weird because uh, we were trying to move out of London and we had, Luxembourg was the country chosen because of tax, you know, favorable tax regime because that's why Amazon's there and Skype were there and PayPal. Uh, it was interesting because we chatted to the Ministry of Technology. I don't know if you have someone like a Secretary of State in Australia for industry or something like that, quite high up in the government. And he was just saying, yeah, if the, if the telecom company, Luxtel, doesn't offer you the right thing, just let us know and we'll sort it out. So there's all sorts of dodginess happening in this. And the really interesting bit is we had another business analyst creating spreadsheets saying, we're going to do music videos, we're going to do all that kind of thing. We were going to exceed the entire bandwidth for Luxembourg within three years, such that they would have to put in new lines into the country and new border routers. Clearly, this was insane. I mean, come on. Um, and then once <laughs> we had our salaries delayed, and. Uh, it was because Dubai thought we were money laundering. The bank in Dubai <laughs> thought we were money laundering. Now, that's, that's serious money laundering because it, it transferred between three bank accounts within two hours, and they went, whoa, this is a bit weird. Um, so that was quite funny. We did get paid, um, so that was nice in the end. Um, 
So the legacy of working there was really good agile stuff and a real alt.net vibe to the whole company. Um, we, the CTO was a bit of an old school CTO. And he had, he believed that you should deploy code by X copying it to your servers or deploying it with Visual Studio and just saying deploy to my server. He was against testing and against build servers. It was a real nightmare fighting him. Uh, at some point, he sacked one of our contractors because the contractor wanted to understand the business problem, not just do what this into the database. He wanted to understand why we were doing it. Uh, sacked him and then threw him off a chair in the office. So it was virtually assault, uh, which I eventually got him removed, but short, uh, I didn't stay. I got offered CTO, but I was like, no, I've already accepted with uh, Huddle. Um, so that was kind of, it was interesting because they thought they were going to get me a CTO, but I kind of gave them a deadline and I stuck to it and they were a week late and that was enough for me to go, no, I'm going to go to Huddle. And they did kind of understand because at that point, Huddle was one of the darlings of the startup scene in London. So I went off to Huddle uh, where I started using Windows 8.1 type phones all the way to here. Um, so I was all, all on those type of phones, but I still had an Android Acer Cloud Mobile. That was a very nice phone as well. Um, so yeah, so I still work for Huddle. I've got about four weeks left, um, but I've stopped it as a startup in 2017 because that's when it was bought out by private equity fund instead of being VC owned. And that really is when you stop being a startup in the same uh, kind of thing. Um, so it started in 2006. And this had really famous VC companies. Eden Ventures and Matrix Partners are quite well-known VC companies in the UK. It had round A, Series A, B, C, and D funding. Um, I came in when it was C funded. Um, and it was finally sold to private equity in 2017. Um, I kind of got my job here uh, because I knew Ian Cooper from London.net user group from that very first startup because I'd started working in central London. Um, so I started, I kind of, it all the way went back 10 years back to that point. Um, and the startup credentials for Huddle, um, it was based on right on Old Street Roundabout, which at the time in Shoreditch was the, was the real startup scene in London. It was called Silicon Roundabout. It was a cool name. Um, it was a moldy old building, and a seriously moldy old building. Uh, that had been offices for TweetDeck and Moo.com. Um, we had things like all the companies in the time had branded gear so that when you left the office, you all had your company logos on. So you, you'd wander around and there'd be people with Yammer t-shirts and they all worked for Yammer. Uh, the bizarre bit is the current office that huddles in has Uber in it and half the Uber employees all were Uber stuff. Um, just so you know, they're from Uber. Um, but you can tell they're from Uber because they're kind of rude. Uh, there's some company culture that Uber has that transfers straight into the behavior of its employees. It's really weird. I don't understand it. Um, I also found that Huddle, the founders of Huddle liked puns because we have Huddleween parties uh, as well as summer and Christmas stuff. Uh, we have a Thunderbirds committee, which was a social events committee. Uh, and common to my startup life is we moved office three times in seven years. So within one year of us being at Old Street, we moved out of that building. Uh, for that year, there was constant, are we moving out? Are we moving out? And the reason we didn't move out is we were paying no rent. We paid a minimal service charge. So VC guys like that. There's no commitment. There's no long-term lease. Um, there's also poorly maintained bathrooms. And within the last month, if any light bulb went in the stairs, they didn't replace them, so you were just wandering around in the dark uh, because they knew they were going to knock the office down um, and things like that. Um, in winter, it was freezing cold, and there was a QA next to me who had about 10 layers on trying to keep warm and wore gloves while typing at a keyboard because it was that cold. And then in summer, it was blisteringly hot and everyone was collapsing through heat. Uh, and the um, CRO, uh, Ed, who, who w used to be in the Royal Fusiliers or something, World Guards who fought in Iraq said, I was in Iraq digging trenches out in 40 degree heat. And we're looking around going, yeah, but we're developers. We didn't sign up to be sweating at a keyboard, I have to say. Um, and then we moved to a new office in Oldgate, which also 
we got because it was a short lease because it was going to get knocked down, which we, as we moved in, we knew that. Uh, and we watched a building built next to it, which eventually we moved into because it was owned by the people who wanted to knock our building down. And then we watched our building get knocked down <laughs> uh, right to the level where we had our offices and we saw it all being chewed down because they couldn't blow it up. They had to knock it down all the way slowly. And we saw our beautiful blue pillars uh, disappear because it's a startup and you must color the concrete pillars in the color of your company, clearly, the right Pantone. Um, so the benefits we had were quite good, actually. Pension, life insurance, there was health and dental insurance. They'd started to have to deal with paternity and maternity leave. I think that was helped by someone in HR having a kid. <laughs> and the moment HR had a baby, there was proper maternity leave created, <laughs> which there wasn't up to that point, apparently. Huddle Cuddle was 500 pound after tax to spend every year for on, on yourself or your family, nothing to do with work. So it was quite nice, because they like puns, so huddle cuddle. 10% um, bonus kind of didn't appear that often. Share options as well. Um, other things they have was Monday morning breakfast, a free meal on a Wednesday, a beer fridge that everyone drinks from on a Friday, all that kind of thing. Very startup-y. So that was our benefits. Crazy shit. Um, we had a version of huddle that wasn't in the cloud. It was actually in the UK Home Office's data center. Um, it, you could only access it through a locked room with a safe bolted to the floor. Uh, I never got clearance, thank God. I didn't want to have to go through all that. Um, but we had to have data lines into the building that were completely separate, lease lines going straight to the UK data center. Um, it was really weird. So people used to go into that room and unlock it, and it was a secret room that everyone went into, uh, the tech ops guys. And they'd have to get someone to read out the error logs because they weren't allowed to actually copy them and stuff like that. Um, the second building we had, uh, one of the meeting rooms had a phone box on the door. The other one had a blue telephone box. It's like TARDIS. Uh, and then a Queen's Guardsman was on the locked room with the safe, which is a good joke because it was like guarded by a guardsman. Uh, and I bet how many people knew that the CIA has a VC arm? Like, of course it does. So it's called InQtel. So if you actually look at documents about Huddle, you know that the CIA invested in Huddle, uh, partly so that we were working with Homeland Security and US federal government. So that's why we've got such a secure system um, with them. So one, the head, ex head of tech ops who just left about four months ago, he remembers delivering to the CIA a DVD of how to install Huddle on their own systems. And he had to do it in a kind of cafe in America, kind of almost under the table. It was really, he didn't know the name of the person he was giving it to. All sorts of weird stuff, because it was CIA. So uh, it's just very weird. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, uh, was a huddle. So secure document collaboration. Problem was, we didn't get traction as fast as we should have. We didn't get the sales. We got bought by, uh, VC, uh, private equity. Uh, we got to learn what a drag clause is. Anyone know what a drag clause is? No. Anyone know about share options? Because a drag clause is when, when the VCs don't get all their money repaid, all your share options are rendered worthless, right? Including all the people who paid for them who've left, get all their shares wiped out. So anyone who'd left the company and bought their shares uh, when they left, got $100, irrespective of what they'd paid for the shares, and some of them had paid thousands of pounds. So, um, yeah. So, and the private equity is a different mentality to a startup. You really do have to make money. Their job is to take people's money and make more money from it. That's, that's how they're set up. They're not meant to speculatively lose money like VC companies, um, you know. It's not like we work where we can just lose one and a half billion a year a quarter and go, hey, who cares? <laughs> you know. Um, so, um, so we turned from a technology company with lots of devs and we've got a lot less devs and we're much more of a software company and that's partly why I'm kind of leaving to go to another technology company. So my takeaways from these four startups is whatever you do, don't rely on share options. The share options will not pay for your house, right? They might do but don't rely on them to pay for your house, right? Uh, just like don't rely on your parents dying to pay for your house, which is the other thing people do. It's like, right, 
I'll get my inheritance. Uh, let them spend their inheritance and have a good time with it. Don't be lying getting it from them. Um, so I learned what a drag clause was, which is a really horrible thing to see it go in. Uh, bonuses are just that. We got them about twice at Huddle, or I did about two or three times. People who'd been there longer started moaning that they hadn't got bonuses. And I said, they're not called expected. They're called bonuses. I go, you shouldn't rely on them to live off. Um, so if you really, when you go into a, a startup, try and get the salary you actually need. Don't try and assume you're going to get the bonus. Assume the share options will be worth something, all that kind of thing. Share options, I've seen them at 7Digital, where the share options were worth a bit, but then they got taxed in a really weird way because they ended up in the US and not in the UK, and it all got a bit messy. Um, so you've got to be a bit careful with share options. Uh, the other thing you see is that every time a, v a startup gets funding, it employs loads of people. It then says, we haven't made enough sales to employ that many people, and then they get rid of some people. Now, I'd say it's like a sine wave, like this. And between every series, it gets more gentle because they learn not to overemploy. So it gets a bit, m bit less painful. The company, U Media, who did that SMS system, I saw them go to 40 developers and designers and then crunch back to five at one point because they just didn't get the money that they needed from sales. So it's quite unpleasant when you're in there. So it's best to, to go to a, a longer lived startup that's learned the lesson because the morale of losing people like that is quite horrific. Um, and the, obviously, big customers dictate how your product's created is really annoying. It doesn't happen with some with bigger companies, but with little startups, you'll just get one customer go, we need the product to do this, which is completely not what the product does. You end up writing it, and it's the only company that ever uses that feature. And it does compromise, annoyingly, the features that would have sold the product better in the long run to everyone. So, uh, but there's not a lot you can do about that because these guys are paying the salaries. So that, that deal can probably bankroll the company for another two months. So you just have to live with that. Those are the downsides, but they're fun. They're hard work at times, but they're really good fun to be in. Uh, you get to learn more. You definitely get given more responsibility because there's less people, so you just have to learn crap and go ahead and get moved on. And you can get promoted faster than most big companies. The only company like that I've seen like that is B Sky B for promoting people quickly internally. Um, when we were being promoted at B Sky B and we were getting promoted quite hard, um, if I'd have been at the BBC. I would have had to have salary grades. You would have had to wait for someone to move on, for you to go up a level, all sorts of weird stuff. So it was much nicer being in small companies. Um, especially when you're going in, it's much easier to negotiate flexible working. Um, to be honest, if you've been there for two or three years and they know you're good, you can probably negotiate flexible working as well. Uh, in a way that big companies claim they do flexible working. <laughs> yeah, that crap. Uh, in my experience, BT, one of the biggest companies has a division that was to do with home working that wouldn't allow any of the people who worked in it to work from home. <laughs> right? It's that kind of weirdness that goes through big companies, annoyingly. Uh, and all check who's already working at the startup. So I went to Huddle because Ian Cooper was there, and I knew Toby Henderson was there, and I knew Bob Gregory was there, and these were really good people who were at that company. And they were using new technologies, they were doing messaging, they were breaking a monolith into microservices before it was a thing. Um, and it was a really good environment to work in, very um, encouraging, uh, new technologies being put in, new, new, and a really good way of using the kind of ThoughtWorks technology radar of adapting technologies at the edge and bring them into the product. So it was really good fun, and you learned a lot. Um, interestingly, someone who joined Huddle, part, one of the reasons he joined was because myself and Ian Cooper were there, and we were Microsoft MVPs. And he said, this must be a great company because it's got Microsoft MVPs. And he was customer support, head of customer support. When he moved on, he went to a company that had Docker captains in it. And he said, you know what I've learned? Is when you move to a company and you go, there's Docker captains here, or there's Microsoft MVPs. And he goes, the reason you've got them is because the software is a pile of crap. And they've had to employ really good people to fix the, yeah, and he goes, so I don't want to go. The next company I go to, I'm not going to go to somewhere with loads of high flyers, because clearly that's a sign there's a problem. <laughs> and having to deal with it, I want to go somewhere where I get easier software jobs. <laughs> but that was someone from customer support, which I think if you're a developer, it's really good fun to work with people like that. Um, and they're better at adopting new frameworks and practices, because it's just easier. Uh, 
And crazy shit happens more often than you'd think. You just have to deal with it and roll with it. And sometimes it's just really good later on that you can talk in the pub about some weirdness that happened standing on the top of a data center in Luxembourg going, there's France, there's Germany, there's Belgium or something, and going, the power's coming from there, the power's coming from there, and discussing the fact that what happens if there was a cold snap and we run out of diesel? This was all to do with what happens if the power goes and diesel generators kick in and keep your computers going. And they said, well, after the military in the airports, we get the next lot of diesel. And it goes, but surely hospitals. Oh, no, the data centers will get the diesel before the hospitals to keep it powered. <laughs> and um, <laughs> really? <laughs> Weird. Um, but uh, their argument, by the way, is hospitals are so reliant on IT. If you don't have the data centers, the hospitals don't function anyway. But uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> realistically, they care more about the computers that Amazon own than keeping someone in Luxembourg alive in a hospital. Uh, was the thing. And uh, finally, coming to a fintech near huddle on the 12th of November, I'm going to free market FX. So maybe in a year's time, I'll, two years' time, I'll do a tale of five startups. Um, but yes, um, that was my tale of being at four startups, and I'm now about to join the fifth because I like them so much. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to. No, it was an opinion piece. Yes, no <laughs> questions. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the party. There's some fun talks before the party. Uh, Richard Campbell's talking. I'm talking. I can't remember whether two or three other people are. And we're only little 10-minute talks, so it won't. If it's boring, it'll be over within 10 minutes. <laughs> so.